Good evening and welcome. I'm Mike Fargione, the Manager of Field Research and Outdoor Programs at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. If you're not familiar with Cary Institute, we're an independent ecological research and educational organization located in southeastern New York. Our scientists study forests and fresh waters, urban ecosystems and the ecology of diseases. They work here in New York as well as around the world. This evening is the first of three weekly forest stewardship workshops we're putting on. Tonight, we're gonna to focus on understanding the ecology and the history of our Northeast forests. Next week, we'll look at threats. And in the final session, we'll have a conversation about measuring the current health of your forest and setting goals for it. This workshop series is a collaborative project with Julie Hart of the Dutchess Land Conservancy. It's always a pleasure to work with Julie and you'll be hearing from her soon. Normally we run this as an all day in-person workshop with indoor conversations and walks to view and compare different forest types and some fun hands-on activities. We hope we can get back to that in the near future. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen, you'll see the chat feature. We'd love it if you'd like to share with us who you are, where you're coming from, and if you want any comments you have about your interest in forest stewardship. During the program, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A feature. We've left plenty of time at the end of the program to answer as many questions as we can. So now without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Julie Hart. Thank you, Mike. And thank you all for joining us this evening. We're really excited to be part of this webinar. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. And... All right, can you see my screen okay? All right, great, thank you. So tonight's webinar is our first session out of three on our webinar series, An Ecological Approach to Forest Stewardship. So as Mike said, tonight we're covering the ecology and history of Northeast forests. And we'll cover, this is a basic outline of what we're gonna be covering this evening. So I'll cover the first three and, and Mike will be wrapping up with the last couple of topics. And then as he said, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So first, let me introduce myself. I'm Julie Hart. I'm an ecologist and the Senior Manager of Stewardship and Education at the Dutchess Land Conservancy. So if you're not familiar with land trusts, it's a nonprofit organization that as its mission is basically protecting land for public benefit. There's a lot of different tools that we use to do that from conservation easements to actually acquiring fee properties and public preserves. But the end goal is always the same, protecting land for public benefit. So the Dutchess Land Conservancy is located in Millbrook, New York. We're actually right around the corner from the Cary Institute. And in the interest of full disclosure, I should tell you, I also did work for quite a number of years at the Cary Institute. So it's been great to keep in touch with all my science nerd friends at the Cary Institute and do some collaborations on these public programs and outreach that we like to do. So the word stewardship that's in our program title, it's in my job title. And it's worth thinking about, what does that mean? So when you think about what does it mean to be a steward of the land? I want you to just turn that over in your head for a few minutes. We'll be talking about it in more detail. And I'd love it if you would type into the chat box your thoughts on what does it mean to be a steward of the land? So the dictionary definition of stewardship is the responsible overseeing and protection of something considered worth caring for and preserving. So yeah, like all dictionary definitions, it kind of leaves a bit to be desired. It's pretty vague, um, it, but it covers a lot of ground. And that's actually a really good thing because stewardship means a lot of different things to different people and different cultures as well. So I've, I've put this quote in, this is one of my very favorites. Um, it's from the Thanksgiving address and greetings to the natural world from the Odonoshani, which is better known as the Iroquois Confederacy. And this is part of a very lengthy address that they use at the beginning of their gatherings, basically giving thanks to the natural world, all the different parts of it. And so this is what they have to say, which to me is, is kind of the essence of stewardship. 
Today, we have gathered and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. Now, what I love about this is that it is also very reminiscent of Aldo Leopold's land ethic, if you're familiar with that, if you've ever read Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac, which is one of the foundational texts of conservation. And the word that jumps out at me here is duty. You know, if you own a piece of land, your stewardship of the land, in some cases, people will consider it to be kind of optional. You know, it's your land, you can do whatever you want with it. But I love the idea that it is a duty, that it's not an optional thing, that it's up to you to consider all the living things that will be affected by your stewardship of the land. Because your stewardship has impacts not just on your land, but on your neighbor's land and on all the plants and animals that share your land with you. So this is a very broad view of stewardship. And to me, it really covers all of the bases of what we should be thinking about when we are thinking about what it means to be a steward of the land. And I love this quote from Terry Tempest Williams. Perhaps the most radical thing we can do is to stay at home so we can learn the names of the plants and animals around us so that we can begin to know what tradition we're part of. Now, I wanna say this quote is from many years before there was a pandemic and we all had to stay at home, but I've seen, you could almost call it a silver lining, which is that because everyone was forced to stay home for so long, a lot of people really connected much more with nature during that time. I've talked to so many people who started obsessively watching birds and taking up gardening and all sorts of outdoor activities. And that's been a wonderful thing to see happening that this increased connection with nature. So what does it mean to be a steward of the land? Let me see if I can look into the chat here. So yeah, a lot of people having some great comments on what it means, preserving the land for the wildlife in the forest and for future generations, caretaking, taking care of the land without owning it necessarily, do no harm, protection and understanding. These are great. Thank you all for typing those in. That's really helpful. So it seems like we're all kind of on the same page about what it means to be a steward of the land. And so some key components of it are listening and observing. It's, it kind of hopefully goes without saying that you should have a plan before you start doing stuff. You know, before you start heading outside with your shovels and rakes or, you know, heaven forbid, chainsaws, think about what you're doing first. What are the, going to be the impacts and the consequences of those? And how will those reverberate through the biological communities that share the land with you? So let's launch right into, oh dear, my screen froze. Oops, hang on. Oh, sorry about that, okay. So first of all, why are forests important? That's kind of why we're here tonight. So the phrase ecosystem services is one that you'll hear sometimes. Natural capital is another way of saying the same thing. Basically, it's an examination of what does the land do for you? What sort of services is the land providing for you and the biological communities that you share the land with? So there's a lot of different categories of ecosystem services that we'll get into. Um, Think about all the different types of land cover. We've got forests, we've got fields, we've got wetlands, we've got stream systems, we've got farmlands. And all of these things are doing a lot of different important um, services, both for humans and the rest of the biological community. Now, I love to include this slide mostly because I climbed the fire tower at Stissing Mountain to get it. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to get a photo of a landscape that has farmlands and forest lands and wetlands in it. So I'm very proud of this picture and I use it as often as I can. So let's go through these ecosystem services. Lots of different categories, way too many words on this slide. Let's break it down one at a time. So first, supporting ecosystem services. These are things like photosynthesis, nutrient cycling, the water cycle and soil formation. Those very foundational processes that support all life microbial to humans, to plants, to fungi. Um, all life is supported by these processes. Next, the regulating services. So these are the things that the land is doing that kind of support the day-to-day -day life, the cogs and wheels of nature, if you will. 
So filtering the air and the water through the soils and the root systems, mitigating floods by it, you know, the land being more intact and able to absorb heavy rainfalls, carbon storage and plant pollination, all things that are so essential to the day-to-day -day workings of all life on the land. Provisioning is just what it sounds like. This is where everyone gets their food from, the land. It all, you know, regardless of what life form you're talking about, whether it's plants, animals, um, all the nutrients are basically coming from the land in some way. Even fish are taking in nutrients that got there through terrestrial cycles, you know, leaves going into streams and ponds and becoming the carbon that moves through the food chain. So our food and fresh water are coming from the land. The timber that we use to build our houses, the fibers that we make our clothes out of, all of these things are land-based. And a little more esoteric, the genetic diversity that is so essential. Think of it as um, the immune system of the world, that, uh, that level of diversity that allows for redundancy. So if one particular species is afflicted by a disease or a contagion, there's another species that might be ready to take over that functional niche in the ecosystem. Many of our medicines come from the natural world and are, some of them are synthesized in the labs, but even then they are usually based on compounds that are created in nature. And we've only scratched the surface of those types of compounds. It's incredibly complex chemistry. And the last type of ecosystem service is the, the cultural um, services that are provided. So here we're talking about the, you know, the refuge that the outdoors can be for you, especially during times like a pandemic, when outdoors is literally safer. So it gives us a place for our recreation, education, you know, learning about the outdoors and becoming more connected with it. And not to mention the spiritual significance and cultural heritage of the land. So let's talk specifically about our forest ecosystem services. And we'll just run through these one at a time. The forest, as you know, is more than just trees. So there's above ground, there's below ground, there's the leaves, the branches, and the roots. It's an enormous amount of life in a forest, but there's more to it than just the trees. There's all the things that live in the trees and eat the trees and the things that eat them. So the food web is very much based on the trees, but it's much more expansive than that. So forests very functionally mitigate our droughts and floods because the, you know, the canopy of leaves is intercepting the rain. So it's not crashing directly into the ground. It you know, hits the ground with less velocity because it's been intercepted by the leaves. And the root systems, which are extremely extensive, allow the soils to soak up that rain more like a sponge preventing a lot of erosive um, runoff that can happen during a heavy rainfall. The roots are also holding soil moisture in place. So the, the water cycle in a forest is a, a very complex thing, but the, the ground in the forest is, it's always kind of a reservoir of water and it's also buffering heavy rainfall. So forests are mitigating our droughts and floods. As you probably know, especially if you have allergies, most trees are wind pollinated. If your nose is running, that's why. There are a lot of trees flowering right now. So most of them are wind pollinated and those are the ones that are bothering you because that pollen is all airborne. But there's a large number of trees that are, are, so that are pollinated by insects. And so things like the catalpa, the locust, basswood, those are all insect pollinated and support enormous populations of those pollinators. Remember, there's not a lot in bloom at this time of year. So the pollinators really need to find some food. And so the tree pollen is something that's available to them. Apple trees are blooming now too. Think about all of the food crops born on trees. A lot of the fruits that we have, especially here in the Hudson Valley, there's an enormous number of orchards. So all of those different trees that are blooming right now of our fruit crops, those are also um, pollinated by insects. And so trees support pollinator populations. They provide shade and reduce energy use. So if you have trees growing near your house, you'll find less need for air conditioning in the summer because the shade really does keep the, the coolness in your house. I'm not saying it's always gonna be cool. It does get hot even when there's trees but it definitely reduces the need to air condition when you have trees shading your house. 
And they also provide us a lovely spot to plop down with a book in the shade and read during the summer. Now, as I mentioned before, the root systems of trees are reducing erosion. They're very much in touch with the soil and literally holding the soil in place during heavy rainfalls. And nowhere is that more important than on stream banks. Streams, because they're moving water, have a lot of capacity to create erosion. And so a tree-lined stream bank is a more protected stream bank that's less likely to wash away in a great big storm. And so um, you'll see changes in land use over time. You know, at this point in time, most of our stream banks are buffered by forests and shrubs that are growing right to the edge. If you look at historical area fo aerial photographs from the early 1900s, you can see a lot of pastures were cleared down right to the streams. And that created a lot of erosion. So that type of land use has really you know, fallen into disuse. The, the riparian areas around the streams and rivers have been revegetated mostly. And so those trees are preventing the erosion that'll be caused by those severe runoff events. Trees and forests are generating and preserving our soils and there's nothing more fundamental to life than soils. It's where everything else comes from. And so the trees, you know, through the leaves falling to the ground, the, the leaves decaying into the soils over time and the root systems holding it all in place. The forests are incredibly fundamental to our soil um, health and stability. Um, don't get me started on soils. It's one of my favorite topics. We should do another webinar on soils. So trees are really, really key components in generating and preserving those soils. And just as a historical note, We'll talk more about land use history later, but you probably know that much of the Northeast had been cleared for agriculture from between the 1700s and the 1800s. And during that time period, a lot of hoof livestock was grazed on those soils. And as a result, a large amount of topsoil just washed off of the entire Northeast. And so a lot of soil was lost. These were soils that had been generated over millennia that were washed away through the loss of forests. Now, as I'm sure you know, trees are really good at filtering pollution. They take in um, carbon dioxide from the air, they give off oxygen through the process of photosynthesis. And in the process of doing that, they're also pulling pollutants out of the air. And so more trees it always means better air quality and therefore better human health. So the photo on the left, I wish I could remember where that photo was from. I think it might be in Europe somewhere, but think about how many trees you see in cities. There's often more than you would think. Urban areas are not as devoid of trees as, as you know, people often think, um, but you can always have more trees and there is a measurable effect on the improvement of air quality and human health when there are more trees present, especially in these urban areas. Through the structure of the root systems and the soil, the tree forests are filtering and purifying our water and providing us with a lot of forest products. Most of our houses are built of wood. That all came from a forest somewhere. Most of us have maple syrup on our pancakes and that came from a forest somewhere. You know, most of your furniture is built out of wood. So, so that's an incredible resource. That's an enormous part of our daily lives. And not just us, but all of the creatures who live in the forest, the wildlife habitat that is provided by forests that gives these animals a place to live to you know, pursue their prey and to be pursued by predators, as the case may be. Most of these photos um, are from wildlife cameras that Mike has up on the Cary Institute, and there's a couple from my camera as well. Uh, so these are all actual wildlife right here in the Hudson Valley. They all coexist in our forests, and the forests are critical for their survival. And then there's the human outdoors. Um, and Forests provide us with a lot of recreational opportunities. There's a lot of public lands um, with hiking trails where you can get outdoors, go hiking or camping. And there's a lot of research indicating that just spending time in the forest is good for you. It lowers your blood pressure, it lowers your pulse rate. It basically reduces stress. You've probably heard of the Japanese 
forest bathing, which I can't remember the Japanese name, but um, I expect a lot of you have heard of that. And there's a lot of research showing that that is an actual fact. Forests do reduce stress. And one thing I was encouraging people to do during the pandemic is, you know what? You can't hug people, but you can hug a tree. Trees aren't going to give you coronavirus, and they are strong and sturdy, and you can go out and hug one. So feel free <laughs> to get out and hug some trees. Um, it's, it's not a negative thing at all. And lastly, supporting biodiversity. This is a huge component of a healthy forest is a large variety of life. So microbial life in the soils, plant life, fungal life, animal life, from mammals to reptiles to insects to birds, all you know in these food webs in the forest and all of that biodiversity the more biodiverse systems you have the healthier those systems are because the more complex the food webs the better off all of the wildlife is so moving along let's talk about some scale so we've got two spatial two types of scale we're going to talk about spatial and temporal and I hope there are some fisher folk in the audience who can appreciate the hilarity of the scale. It's a brook trout, if you can't tell. It's a real close up of fish scales. Anyway, sorry, I'm just cracking myself up. So spatial scale, this is um, a map of one of the online mapping utilities that we'll cover in session three, basically showing the tax parcels in Dutchess County. So this is our landscape. This is our local landscape. And I want you to kind of think about it at different scales. So humans tend to think in a human scale. Well, of course we do. What else would we think in? But remember, trees are bigger than humans and forests are bigger than trees. So if you're going to think about managing your forest, being a good steward of your forest, you need to be thinking of things at different scales. So macro, meso, and micro scales. So first of all, macro, this is the landscape as a whole. This is, as you can probably tell, this is a Google Earth photo of southeastern New York and western Connecticut. You can see the Hudson River running right up in the middle of the screen there. And what I want you to notice is just how much green there is. You can see urban areas, they're a little bit lighter in color and kind of densely populated. You can see the lighter green colors and those are generally farmlands. And you can see how it kind of swoops across the landscape. That's a geological formation where there's just pretty good farmland soils. So those are used mostly for agriculture. But within that and surrounding that are enormous contiguous forests. So think about every tree in your area, the tree that grows right in your front yard is part of this macro system. It's part of the greening of New England. This is the scale that we usually are experiencing for us, the meso scale. It's just kind of what you see in front of your face. And I find it really helps to think in other scales while I'm in the forest. It makes people who go for walks with me a little bit crazy because, because I'm constantly looking at the trees and then swinging my arms wide and saying, but look at this whole big landscape that this forest is a part of. You know, it's in this valley or it's in this floodplain and think about how that connects to the land around us. But then the next thing you know, I'll be pulling out a magnifying glass and crawling around on my hands and knees looking at tiny things in the leaf litter. So looking at all the different scales, you know, zoom in on those trees. This photo here is a photo of some trees not too far from where I live. Zooming in on the tree trunk, you can see, wow, there's a lot of life. There's a lot of different types of mosses and lichens growing on that tree trunk. So take a minute to zoom out and then take a minute to zoom in when you're in the woods. Start carrying a magnifying glass with you because you will see so much more when you do that. So consider multiple layers of spatial scales when you're thinking about your forest. Also consider temporal scales. So again, humans think on a human time scale. And so we need to consider that the organisms in the forest some have much longer lifespans and others have much shorter lifespans. This is my favorite cartoon of all time. So the average human lifespan is about 79 years. This is a photo of my grandmother who died several years ago at the age of 100, proving what most of us already knew, which is that grandma's above average. Um, so that's a normal human lifespan. 
but wildlife and plants have widely different white lifespans from humans. And so, you know, a bird will live for a couple of years. Insects generally live for days to weeks, but oak trees can live for 400 years or more. Trees have incredibly long lifespans when they're in an area where they're not threatened by disease or being cut down. So when I think about land stewardship, the message I'm always trying to communicate is that your land tells a story. Every bit of land tells a story. And your stewardship of this land is writing a chapter in that story. And so think about how long this tree is going to live. You know, if it's going to look back in a few hundred years, what is your chapter going to say? What is your chapter of that story going to say about your stewardship of the land? So taking the long view is really important when you're talking about forest stewardship. When you work for Mother Nature, you get paid by father time. Remember, nature moves on a much different time cycle than humans do. You have to be patient. Trees grow slowly compared to humans. And so it's really, really important to keep that time scale in mind when you're planning forest stewardship. And when you're thinking about the long-term consequences of what your stewardship plans involve. So moving right along, the parts are all connected. The science of ecology is so fascinating because it really does show us that everything is connected to everything else. It's like, you know, that John Muir quote where he says, when you try to tug on one thing by itself, you find it connected to the rest of the universe. And that's really, really true. If you just look at the forest around your house or even a tree in your yard, you know, it's pulling in carbon dioxide that was released into the air from far away. It's releasing oxygen. It's got insects that have, you know, traveled far. It's maybe got a bird nest in it from a bird that has traveled up from, you know, Central America where it overwintered. So there's a, an enormous amount of connectivity in ecological systems. Don't let it overwhelm you. <laughs> It's very, very complex. It's so complex that humans literally can't understand it all. But the most important thing is to understand that it works. It is a system that nature has evolved over time. And even if we don't understand it, it still works. It's still all connected. So let me go on a slight tangent here with a fine quote from Marcus Aurelius about change. Because if you think about you know, these long time scales, you have to understand that you know, time is going by, complexity is a very big element. And the most important thing is to, to know that change happens. That is just the way of the world. We can't keep things the way they are. They will always continue to change. And as Marcus Aurelius points out, the world is maintained by change in the elements and in the things they compose, to which I would just add, and in the things that decompose. So let's just talk about tidiness in the woods. Tidiness doesn't really have a place in the woods. Um, sometimes you see people out picking up branches. If picking up branches out of your lawn is fine, you don't need to do that in the woods. All that stuff is called coarse woody debris. It's branches that have died and fallen out of the trees. Maybe they've been broken off in a storm. But the, the substance that makes up those branches is made up of elements that the tree was taking up out of the ground and that it was taking out of the air and it made it into wood. And so when you leave it on the ground, it's allowed to decompose and return to the soil where the next generation of trees can use it. Um, if you think about, you know, the inevitability of change, you know, think about the chapter that you are writing in your forest's history. Have you ever read a book where everything was exactly the same at the end as it was at the beginning? No, of course not. That would be crazy. Stories change things. So understanding that things are going to change and understanding that these cycles are part of the natural complexity of these systems is really, really important. So consider that a dead tree is the most alive thing in the forest. The tree itself is dead. Here's a rotting log. And here's all this stuff that's living in, under, or around that log. There are plants, mosses, lichens, mushrooms, insects, amphibians, all kinds of stuff living in and around that log that are re relying on its nutrients for their life and in the process breaking down that dead log into the next layer of the food web. So 
there's no need to clean up the woods. You can just leave stuff out there. It's part of the natural cycles. Another slight tangent, but this is a really important concept for you to understand to be a, a good steward of the forest is root systems. We don't know as much about the roots as we know about the top part of the trees because of course they're underground. But you often see it illustrated like this where the root system is essentially a mirror image of the trees, branches and canopy system. So that's not how trees grow. Sometimes you see the roots even smaller than the canopy. Oh my gosh, that's worse. So in fact, tree roots extend two to three times past the canopy's diameter. Um, past where the, where the tree branches extend. And in general, those tree roots, the vast majority of them are in the top foot of the soil. And so tree roots, for the most part, don't go nearly as deep as you think they do, but they go a heck of a lot wider than you think they do. And so when you are looking at an individual tree, remember it has a lot of underground connections that you need to consider when you are you know, making any kind of management decisions. Um, that there's a lot of there's a lot going on, on underground that you can't see, but but you know that it's there and it's part of the whole functionality of the system. So just keep that general knowledge of tree anatomy in your mind as we're moving through these three sessions of forest stewardship. So I'm going to launch back into our temporal scale now with a little bit of a timeline and overview of the history of our northeast forests. I gratuitously throw in my favorite cartoon again, just so everybody can get a laugh out of it. So let's think about our landscape here in the Hudson Valley. About 12 to 15,000 years ago, the last ice age was ending. The glaciers were melting. They were generally retreating to the north, which just means that they were melting faster than they were pushing to the south. So when a glacier retreats, it leaves a lot of gravel and rocks. There's basically no biological life when a glacier is retreating. It's just plowed everything in front of it across the land. The ice was probably at least a mile thick here. So as the glacier is retreating, you're left with a lot of rocks and gravel. And over time, soils begin to form. So lichens and mosses are usually the first pioneers. And they will very, very gradually over thousands of years be breaking down the rocks, allowing larger plants to get a toehold and eventually grasses and forbs begin to grow. And uh, at that point, we would have had something like a savanna ecosystem in this area. And over time, again, probably a thousand years or two, forests come to dominate the Northeast. And so at some point in this history, we don't know exactly when, but humans arrived on the scene. So what we don't know about their stewardship is, is pretty tremendous. We do know that People have existed in this area for many, many thousands of years. And they were land managers and continue to be. Their, uh, their forest stewardship followed the, you know, the quote that I gave you at the beginning with a, having a duty to the land, a duty to live in harmony with all living things. And so their society was to a certain extent agrarian. They had farmlands growing corn, beans and squash. And forest management, we think probably involved of some set fires. We don't know how extensive those were, but basically humans existed here for many thousands of years and they stewarded the lands in their own way. And about 500 years ago, change started to happen pretty rapidly. So what I want you to notice here is just how quickly things are changing from the land's perspective. Remember the land is going through these very gradual changes over thousands of years. And then suddenly things start to happen. So Columbus reaches the Caribbean in 1492, a little over hundred years later, Henry Hudson sails up the Hudson River in the half moon. Not much has changed on the land in this point. The Native American societies are still here. They're beginning to be impacted by diseases that are spreading. And over time, European colonists begin to clear these extensive forest lands. So there are some patents filed with the British Crown, which gives people the ownership of the land with the requirement that they tame the land, meaning you know, clearing it for agricultural agriculture and settling it. And so this starts to happen in about the 1700s or so, and it really picks up speed 
until the middle of the 1800s when, depending on where you are, 40 to 80% of the land throughout New England has been cleared for farming. So huge amounts of forests were cut down, turned into houses, um, burned for firewood, and now the lands are being used for agriculture. A lot of things happen to change that. The Industrial Revolution you know, draws people into the cities. The Louisiana Purchase allows people to go farm in places where honestly the soils are a heck of a lot better. And there's a kind of region-wide abandonment of farmland. So from the mid 1800s until the present, much of this land that had been cleared for farming is returning to forest. Forests just kind of naturally seed themselves across the landscape. So there's a natural return to forest, but at the same time, our very you know, global lifestyle has brought in a lot of invasive species. And our development patterns have made the landscape very fragmented. And so instead of a large intact forest, we have something that's fairly fragmented and is challenged by a lot of these invasive species. That's something we'll talk about in much more detail next week. So what I want you to take away from this whole timeline is just the fact that things changed really, really fast from the land's perspective. So I'm going to leave you with a quote from Shakespeare that I'm sure you're familiar with. All the world's a stage. Everybody's heard this quote, right? And does, what does this have to do with for, forest stewardship? Well, okay, not much. Let me just rephrase the bard a bit to make it fit. All the land is a stage and all the species in it are merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one life in its time plays many parts. So when you are protecting a forest, you're protecting the stage where the play is happening. The play is happening all around us all the time. It's biology, basically. It's all these ecosystems and their functions and the life that inhabits it. Over time, species come and go. Some of them populations decline and some of them populations increase depending on the type of land use that we're looking at. Um, but there's this constant flux in and out. And one life in its time plays many parts. Remember each organism is part of the whole cycle, the whole, um, the food web and the cycles of nature. And so the life, you know, pick out an oak tree. That's one life. So that oak tree is itself, it's a tree, but it's also probably the mother of many oak seedlings that are in the area. It's the giver of shade that I will sit under and read a book in the summertime. It's home to the squirrel that nests in its branches. It's home to the birds that are flittering around. It's a food source for a lot of animals when the acorns fall. So each life on the landscape impacts a lot of other lives. But when you're protecting the land and when you're stewarding it carefully, you're protecting the stage where the play happens. And those changes can happen in their own time and place. But being a good steward of the land means thinking about more than just you and your trees, thinking about the other organisms that are occupying that land with you and all of the lives that they are touching with their own life. And so with that, I will stop my screen share and hand it over to Mike to go into succession and land use history. Thank you, Julie. And let's see if we can get started here. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. So you did a great job of introducing what forests do for us, as well as talking about um, some of the processes that have led to where we are, but we wanna look more closely at what shaped today's forests. It's easy to look at a beautiful forest here in the Northeast and to imagine it's always looked the way it does. But as Julie already mentioned, um, ecologists consider that today's forests um, are very different from what we was there in the past. Um, when ecologists look at forests, they repeatedly come to the conclusion that the forests we see today are not what was here in the past, that our forests today continue to constantly change, and probably what we see today is going to be different than what's here in the future. And as Julie mentioned, we want to keep in mind that the time frame of changes in forest communities is not really intuitive to us because the lifespan of a tree 
can be hundreds of years and is equivalent to several human generations. So it makes it difficult for humans to see these changes. What I'd like to task you with is on your next forest walk, I'd encourage you to do more than just enjoy the beautiful scenery and consider what the site might have looked like 50, 100, maybe even three or 400 years ago. And then imagine what the processes are that could have shaped it to become what you see today. And we're gonna explore those processes a little more detail today. The plant communities we see today resulted from many processes, including the past climate, the plant Mike, species. Yeah. Mike, can I just break in? I don't think you're sharing your screen yet. Oh, okay. Don't know why that didn't happen. How's that? There you go. It's what impacts forests, climate and plants first. Yeah. That's All it. Right. Okay, good. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, start there then. Very good. Okay. So the plant communities we see today resulted from many processes, including the past climate, the plant species and how they disperse and how they establish themselves competition and succession, what species come to dominate sites, and finally, the impacts of natural and man-made disturbances. And particularly, we're gonna talk about the legacy of past land uses by people. As Julie mentioned, it can be helpful to remember that the glaciers tore away all the vegetation and even the soils that were once here. When they receded 12 to 15,000 years ago, they left behind really a stark landscape, maybe like this, this photograph. Um, plants eventually started to move north at different rates, depending on how their seeds were dispersed. And they began to colonize this bare landscape, forming soils, changing conditions, and making the site suitable for even more plants and other animals. And our climate has continued to change as the glaciers receded. Um, favoring some species over others. Plants differ in their establishment and their sur survival requirements. These differences shape the forest communities. They can differ, differ in the amount of light they require to establish and grow. They can differ in their uh, nutrient requirements and soil fertility needs, how much water they require, how much water they can tolerate. Uh, plants can differ in their capacity to, su to survive extreme climate. Um, as plants compete for resources um, and they have different adaptions and life history strategies, it results in some plants out competing others. And that's the process that has shaped our forests to today. Light is really one of the most critical factors that influence which plants uh, have an advantage at a site. They differ in the amount of shade they can withstand and still be competitive. Uh, we can think of this as different tree species differing in how much shade they can tolerate. A bare ground or a grassy meadow like you see in the photo on the left provides lots of available light. If a tree can be established there, it has plenty of light to grow. Trees that require full sun have a better chance to grow if they get to the site first. And so the pioneering species of trees often have tiny light windblown seeds that increase they're the first ones to arrive. The center photo, we can see trees as they grow change their immediate environment. They reduce the amount of light that reaches the ground and this change in the light availability provides advantages to more shade tolerant trees that helps them to outcompete some of their neighbors. As trees grow and fill available space, the leaf canopy captures most of the sunlight, allowing less sun to reach the ground. And you can see that in the photo on the right. Once the tree canopy closes in, only seedlings of the most shade tolerant trees can gain the advantage. So competition for light leads to winners and losers among the tree species. And this results in a gradual change or a succession of different plants dominating a site over time. And as we said, the time frame is very difficult for us to imagine because of the differences in our lifespans versus those of trees. 
plants compete, uh, plant competition can move forests through different, different stages uh, based on how much shade the different individual species can tolerate until they reach what is known as a climax forest type, which means that that type can perpetuate itself over time. Disturbance is an important process that interrupts that succession and can revert a forest back to an earlier stage. There are natural disturbances like windstorms and floods, ice storms and fire. There are biological disturbances, things like the activity of beaver, pests and pathogens. And of course, there are many human disturbances, things like logging and clearing for agriculture and development. These all can cause a loss of vegetation on a site. And all disturbance causes a void or a gap in the vegetation, which allows plant succession to begin again. These gaps, as they're called, can be small, as small as a single plant, or they can cover many miles, for example, after a windstorm or a hurricane. If the disturbance is large enough and conditions change sufficiently, the resulting forest community may be very different than what was originally there. And that, in fact, is exactly what has taken place here in the Northeast over the last 300 years. When we're thinking about forest communities, we want to be sure not to forget the animals that are part of those forests. And the animals depend on the plants and in turn impact the plants themselves. They're all connected and they all impact each other. Many people value forests for the wildlife that inhabit them, but what makes a place suitable for wildlife? Well, the primary requirements for wildlife are appropriate and adequate amounts of food and water and cover. They need that for hiding, for feeding, and for raising their young. How well these needs are, are met reflect the soils and topography and the climate of an area, but they also more importantly reflect the plants that are found in the area and how they're distributed along and across the landscape. Understanding how plant communities form and how they change helps us to understand if a site is gonna be suitable for a particular kind of wildlife. It also gives us some insight on how to manage a forest if we wanna attract or even repel specific kinds of wildlife. So this is a classic depiction of plant succession taking place over time, starting on the left from bare soil and moving through time towards the right and ending in what's called, a, again, a climax forest. Disturbance can take, pl take place at any point in this time frame, and turns the path of succession back to a previous stage. Notice the bars over the plants and the names of the different birds here. It's just a reminder that the other organisms are also part of this community and that animal species change as the forest structure changes. So as succession moves forward, the animals that uh, need those plants will change and move along with it. So now we're gonna step back and look at some of the land use history changes that have taken place more closely over the last 300 years. Julie talked about them briefly, but we wanna look at them a little more in depth. We're gonna use the beautiful Harvard Forest dioramas to illustrate different stages of past land use. You should definitely visit the Harvard website and look at this resource. It really helps to understand how our forests have changed and why they look the way they do today. Prior to European settlement, our forests were the result of repeated disturbance and then succession, starting when the glaciers stripped everything away. Ecologists have speculated on what the mid-Atlantic and southern New England forests might have looked like before um, the Europeans arrived on the scene. Mostly they think it was old forest, but with greater diversity of tree types and greater diversity of tree ages than we see in the forests of today. There was a considerable amount of open habitat, even though there was a lot of um, old forest. And the, the um, open habitats resulted from things like natural disturbances, flooding by beaver, 
and as Julie mentioned, man-made clearings uh, as the Native Americans cleared areas for farming and to produce better habitat for game. Ecologists also believe the forests uh, before European settlement were also dominated by different trees than we have primarily dominating today. There were more chestnuts and oaks and hickories and perhaps fewer maples, pines and hemlocks in those early forests. As we talked about, European colonists found these open habitats along the coast that were prime for farming. And these were the first areas that were farmed by the new inhabitants. These were primarily cleared fields of Native American populations that had been decimated by European diseases. The colonists began to farm these areas and then they rapidly expanded, clearing more of the interior lands till they spread throughout the region. By 1800, at least three quarters of the uh, land area in our area in the Hudson Valley was probably deforested. Uh, it was cleared for livestock pastures, for plowed fields, and planted to crops. Our rocky eastern soils were often the product, um, didn't produce great crops, and they produced really good hard scrabble farms with lots of stone walls, but they were tough to farm. In addition, many of the early farmers had relatively poor farming techniques that increased erosion and it resulted in a lot of our hilltops losing their topsoil and created even poorer conditions for the farmers to grow things in. These depleted fields and even entire farms were abandoned here in the Northeast as the Erie Canal and the railroads made travel easier and provided a means for rapid transport of food back from the Western fertile lands to the markets here on the East Coast. So many, many farms were abandoned in the 1800s and early 1900s. These ab abandoned farms created large areas of new habitat that were dominated by many different kinds of herbaceous and woody plants. In particularly the windborne seeds of pines and other pioneering trees were quick to recolonize abandoned fields. In turn, as we've mentioned, wildlife will follow the plants and these new habitats resulted in an expansion and increase in wildlife, particularly those species that require early successional stages of forests. So the widespread abandonment of farms resulted in thousands of acres of new forest. And if you looked at any one block of that new forest, uh, most of the trees would have been of similar age based on when the blocks were abandoned. At the turn of the century, there was another bout of land clearing, this time to harvest the white pines and other evergreens that had colonized the farm fields after they were abandoned. This led to another change in the composition of our early forests, reducing the amount of pine and favoring the amount of hardwoods. Also, before European colonization, fire was an important disturbance that allowed oaks and hickories and other uh, shade intolerant species to dominate many of our mid-Atlantic and Southern New England forests. These shade intolerant oaks and hickories were adapted to survive light fires and that helped them to outcompete things like maples, which were killed. In the last hundred years, fire suppression has reversed this process and we now see maples slowly replacing oaks as the dominant trees in many of our forests. So as you walk through a forest here in the Northeast, try to notice the uh, look and features of that forest and just notice how many of them are even aged and dominated mostly by hardwoods. This is the result of their being abandoned at the same time and the legacy of our past uses of these forests, um, land use practices. So we've talked in general terms about the region as a forest and what, what's formed the forests of the region. And I wanna now look at more closely an example. And we'll use the property at Cary as our example. These are aerial photos of the Cary Institute and show how it looked on the left in 1936 and on the right in 2020. 
So it was estimated that around 1800, about three quarters of the property was cleared and in agricultural production. Only the steepest slopes that were rockiest were left in forest. And these weren't untouched forests. They were cut repeatedly, mostly for firewood. The photo on the left, it, taken in 1936, shows how the property was still mostly covered with fields at that time. But many of those fields had been recently abandoned and were already growing back to woody plants. You can see the dark areas in the middle and the middle left, middle right, excuse me. Um, those are the steep slopes that were at the time covered with real forests. The rest of the area were either open agricultural lands or agricultural, agricultural lands that were starting to grow back um, into woodlands. If you look at the photo at the right, you can see that now in 2020, almost three quarters of the property has grown back to mature forests. And so we've had a complete reversal from three quarters open to three quarters forested in a matter of less than a hundred years. The photo on the left shows an isolated tree in amongst agricultural fields. In the past, farmers would often leave an oak or a hickory out in the field to provide shade or food for livestock that were using the pastures. On the right in the photo, you see a large white oak that once grew in an open pasture along a farm lane. On the one side was a pasture, on the other was a crop field. The old oak you can see is now surrounded by younger trees, all about the same age that sprang up after the fields were abandoned. Views like this are really quite common here in the Northeast. Take the time and look for them and I'm sure you'll find them in your local forests. Forest ecologists who have studied the Cary property and look back through deeds and other records and they've tried to explain why the current forests came to be what they are. They found there were three, there are currently are three major forest communities on the property. The first is dominated by chestnut oak and northern red oak, and it's located on steep rocky upper slopes. These were those forests we looked at earlier that were never cleared for agriculture, but were used as woodlots to provide firewood for people. They also found a forest community that was dominated by white and black oak and pignut hickory. And these were primarily on the lower elevations, but they were on poor soils, uh, areas that were probably abandoned pastures. All of those livestock moving around those pastures added to erosion and the loss of soil. And so those were poor sites and grew back into those species that I just mentioned. And finally, the third forest community that they've noticed was made up of red maples and white pines. And those species are dominant on very fine textured, less rocky old field sites. And they think these were the sites where people actually plowed the land and planted crops. So red maple and white pine are species with light seeds that are blown by the wind. And so they would have been quick to uh, colonize these plowed fields when they were abandoned. They looked at the species composition of the current forest and they've tried to figure out what was here before the agricultural uses. And the way they did that was to look back at old deeds. And many of the old deeds describe at certain corners of a property, there would be a particular species of tree found. And so they could use that to determine what the proportions of different species of trees would have been in the original forest. And what they found is that white and black oak have declined over the years in importance and red maple is increasing in importance. So we can see on this particular site that we've had significant changes in the types of forest in just over a hundred years because of the land use of the people who were using and managing those fields. So in summary, the forest communities we see today result from our past climates, how plants differ in their dispersal and their spread, how they compete, how succession allows plants to compete with each other, and how impacts of natural and man-made disturbances set back succession. The timeframe of our forests change 
is not intuitive to us and succession results from competition and creates that shifting matrix of species of both plants and animals, those players on the stage. Disturbance resets communities to an earlier, but not necessarily the same successional stage. Our forests are also being shaped by other human actions like development and habitat loss and fragmentation. There are invasive plants and insects and diseases. The impacts of too many deer have significant impacts on our forests and sometimes hands off management or letting nature take its course can have negative impacts. We hope that you will join us next Tuesday, May 11th at 6 p.m. when we will begin to consider these other forest threats. But for now, I think we'll try and take some questions and I'll stop sharing and we'll see if um, there's any questions. Are you there, Julie? I am here. Okay, do we have any questions? Not yet. I do want to thank the person who typed into the chat the Japanese word for forest bathing, which is Shinrin Yoku. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. I have to remember that word. So yeah, we finished up a little bit early. We wanted to make sure there was lots of time for questions. And um, so please go ahead and type into the chat if you have any thoughts or questions that you'd like to share. So we've got an observation that these days disturbance does much worse than set us back. And that is really true. We'll talk about disturbance more next week in terms of both natural disturbance and human caused disturbances. So, Julie, there's a question about downwood and is it a fire threat with changing climate? Okay. Let's see. It, that is an excellent question. I think the answer to that is kind of regional in nature. So I think what you're probably thinking of is the fire threat in the West where there was a hundred years of fire suppression, which is causing these inc incredibly intense wildfires now because there is so much downwood. It's less of a threat in the Northeast, mostly because we have a much higher level of humidity here. And so you don't often hear about forest fires in the Northeast. They're not impossible, but they're, they're much less common here, partly because our forests tend, to, our general climate is more humid and damp. So you don't get that incredibly dry tinder box. Um, and downed wood actually in our forests it tends to be quite damp, it actually holds, it's, it's almost sponge-like in its inability to hold moisture. In many of our forests, we'll talk about next week, we have impacts of too much deer browsing, and so there's very little understory. And in fact, that down wood is often some of the only structure that's available for wildlife, insects, amphibians, um, other, other animals. It's the only um, habitat that's available out there for them to live. And so uh, removing that not only uh, eliminates nutrients, but it also eliminates some really important habitat for wildlife. Yeah, so we're getting questions both in the Q&A and the chat. So we'll try to monitor both of those. Um, so here's an easy one. The book that I mentioned about stewardship, I think the, the one that I probably mentioned was Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac which is, I think I referred to it as one of the foundational texts of conservation. So the Sand County Almanac is definitely one to put on your reading pile if you have not already read that. There's a question about how has drought from last year affected wildlife populations and or tree growth and health? I, I don't think the conditions we had last year were so severe that they had widespread negative impacts on trees or wildlife. Um, they are adapted to fluctuations in, in water. And so um, they're able to withstand too much and too little um, as long as it's not extreme. Yeah, and the, the drought, has, a drought has a lot of different impacts. So remember when Mike was talking about changes at, resulting in winners and losers, basically. So when there's a drought, you know, there's a lot of negative impacts 
on trees and wildlife, but research at the Cary Institute has shown that one of the potentially positive impacts is that ticks desiccate. And so the one year we had a very dry spring was a year when the tick populations were surprisingly low. So those kind of widespread disturbances can have kind of un, kind of unexpected consequences. And, and as I think we've said a, a lot, the complexity of these systems make it really difficult to predict exactly how it's going to affect the various species. There's a question, Julie, about the New York State Forest Preserves, the Adirondacks and the Catskills, and how did human impacts, uh, how did humans impact these areas? Um, they certainly had an impact on the species composition of those forests. In many cases, uh, the early uh, land uses involved a lot of widespread logging, either for timber or in the Catskills, there was a lot of logging of hemlock for the bark for tanning. And so it did result in changes in the makeup of the forests. It also created uh, great amounts of woody slash or dead wood on the ground, much more than would be typical in a, in a forest. And that did result in some cases in some widespread fires um, that not only impacted uh, the existing plants in sites, but also actually the soils in some sites because the fires could have been so hot. Usually that was the result of a combination of lots of woody debris from logging and sparks from wood burning locomotives setting it off. Um, so those are some of the effects they had. Some of those areas were farmed and cleared and they were probably some of the areas that were abandoned first because they were quite rocky. Now here's another interesting question. What were the poor agricultural practices that the European farmers were using? So I think we both touched on this a little bit. Often it involved um, grazing animals on slopes and areas where there was a high probability of erosion and the hooves of cows and sheep in particular would cut through the sod that was there or the plants and allow rainstorms to wash that soil away. Um, some of the ways that they plowed the land as well may not have necessarily been the best agricultural practices. And so those things tended to cause greater amounts of erosion and the loss of the topsoil, particularly from the hills and the hillsides. Right. And remember how different European agricultural practices are from the Native American agricultural practices. So the Native Americans would either find or create a field and then they would farm it for a certain number of years. But farming takes a lot of nutrients out of the soil and eventually the soil would be exhausted. The Native Americans would just move to a different place. They would rotate into a different area, have a different field where they would grow their crops. Europeans had a culture where when you settle there, you, you stay there and you don't rotate. You have your farm and that's where you, you are doing your agriculture. So just two different, very, two very different lifestyles, basically, and two very different approaches to agriculture. Julie, there's a question about lots of ticks this year so far. <laughs> I would agree with that. I'm finding lots of ticks. I would too. Ticks. And um, so partly it's been, it's been damp, which is, allows them to survive. Um, primarily, I think the population surge is because there was a mass year two years ago. So a mast year is when there's a lot of acorns on the oak trees, very heavy acorn crop. And the, there are years and years of research at the Cary Institute to, to support this conclusion. And we'll talk about this a little bit next week. Um, basically, a huge acorn crop feeds a lot of animals, including mice and deer. Mice and chipmunks are the primary vectors of uh, black-legged ticks that carry Lyme disease, among other pathogens. And so year one, you have a large acorn crop, a mast year. Second year, you have a population boom in the small mammal populations, especially the mice. And year three, which is where we are now, you get a lot of ticks because of that increased mouse population last year. So it's a very predictable cycle. And unfortunately, it looks like this is going to be a pretty big year for ticks. So I just want to remind everyone to tuck your pants into your socks when you go outside and wear light colored clothing and check yourself a lot for ticks. And thank you for bringing that up. That's always something worth reviewing. 
Another interesting uh, observation that there were a, a lot of southern pine beetle damage a few years ago, and this person lost many of their pitch pines. And has this been impacted, have other areas been impacted like this? So the southern pine beetle is a native insect that's uh, native to the southern parts of the United States. It typically hasn't moved this far north uh, until just recent maybe the last five years. Um, it impacts certain types of pines like pitch pine, red pine. Um, it does not impact uh, our northern native white pines. So the damage that it will do will depend on which pine species you have on your, your land. Um, but with climate change and warming winters, we probably can expect uh, this insect to increase and to continue to move north and impact people who have the kinds of pines it likes to eat. Now, here's a great question. Do you have services to help us figure out how to be a good steward? Um, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, the, the DLC is currently in the process of um, developing a, a new website and we do hope to have a, a very broad resources page on the website, which is going to have a lot of that type of information on it. In the meantime, the DEC is a great source for management, um, stewardship resources, local Cornell Cooperative Extension, uh, the local Soil and Water Conservation District. There are a lot of um, foresters who could help you develop a forestry plan for your land. And there are quite a lot of landscape professionals who work with native species and are, are working to be good stewards of the land and to kind of encourage that type of stewardship. So those are some of the resources that I would suggest. There, there are a lot, a, a lot of resources available, um, especially right here locally. We have some great organizations here in Dutchess County. The um, federal NRCS service um, also has resources that are available. And in fact, they, typically get some funds through the farm bill to help people by providing uh, partial payments for certain practices that can help you be uh, managing your land. So it's worth a visit to their website and maybe a visit to the local office to see what kinds of things they can offer you. They may also have um, materials as well as expertise um, they can share with you on being better stewards. I see, uh, what are our thoughts about land acknowledgements? And does Cary Institute do this? I'm not sure I know what a land acknowledgement is. So that is something that has been much more common in recent years. In the land trust community, it has become pretty much standard practice whenever we're having a conference or a regional gathering that the speaker acknowledges the history of their land. So for example, I would say that I am coming to you from Millbrook, which is the traditional lands of the, probably the, the Wapur. Hmm? Is it the Mohican? The Mohicans, Dutchess County is kind of on a boundary actually. So we're at the very Northern extent of the Lenni Lenape and the Southern extent of the Mohicans. And the local tribes are, if you look at the names of the roads and the physical features of the landscape, the Wappinger tribe, um, uh, their traditional lands were in Southern Dutchess County. The Sapascos were in the Rhinebeck area. There's still a Sapasco Lake there. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of native words on our maps that I think we don't appreciate. And I'd love to do a study of that, how many of our local place names originated from native cultures. There's a question about, are there foresters who are skilled at guiding forest owners in managing their woods for their ecological services, not for timber harvesting? And yes, the answer is you can find people who will do both. Um, really what's most important is for you to sit down and make clear what your goals for a particular property are. Um, you can work with foresters, consulting foresters, as, as well as with wildlife biologists um, organizations like the National Wild Turkey Federation, the Rough Grouse Society also have biologists that will come out and work with landowners to help them be better managers. So there are resources out there and people who can help you with that. 
And I think that also answers another question that's been typed in that you mentioned a hands-off approach is not always the best. What are some basic forestry management practices to consider for landowners? So I think your answer should cover that as well. And then I would just add that the, you know, the, the reason the hands-off is not a great approach in our area is the invasive species. They are so aggressive. And if you don't manage at all, I've seen a lot of places in this area that are just blanketed in invasive species. So, so hands-off is, is going to result in a tangled mess of invasives, unfortunately. There's a question about my property is in the foothills of the Schwangunks. Someone told me the forest isn't very healthy due to several factors, including it was likely used for sheep for some period. Is there a way to tell if the property was previously used for sheep grazing? Honestly, it's a pretty good bet that it was. Sheep grazing was huge in the Northeast throughout the, I think it was late 1700s to early 1800s. There was kind of a wool boom in Europe around that time. And so sheep were, were um, very, very common livestock to have. It was a great cash crop. So a general historical progression of our lands. First, it was kind of hard scrabble farming for subsistence. Then it was sheep farming, eventually a lot of dairy farming. And then when the dairy industry kind of imploded 40 years ago, we've now got horse farms and a lot of variability. Actually, there's a huge amount of diversity in the farms that we have here, which is really nice to see. And that actually leads right into another question. So every time you see stone walls in the forest, those used to be used to delineate farmland. And that, yes, that is exactly correct. Um, and I, I've had many hilarious conversations with people wondering, why would anyone build a stone wall in the woods? And the answer is, well, it wasn't woods when they built the stone wall, it was a field. And every spring, the frost heaves would pitch up some more rocks out of the ground and they had to haul them out before they plowed their lands. So most of those stone walls are, I've heard them referred to as linear landfills. They were taking the rocks that came up out of the soil, moving them off to the side to kind of fence in pastures and croplands and just to get them out of the soil and, so that they could plow. And in many cases, those walls were meant to keep animals out rather than to keep animals in. And so right. they would put the walls around their crops to keep their livestock from entering the croplands because the animals were allowed to roam freely in the forests. Yes. Now here's a question about ice storms. This is an interesting one. So more ice storms lead to more down trees and branches and may increase with a warmer climate. So how might this affect us and ecosystems? So I'm hoping this is someone who saw the Cary Institute talk that was a while ago about the research on ice storms. Um, and yes, we'll talk more about this next week um, when we talk about disturbances. But um, the, the ice storm that I'm remembering is the 1998, I think it was, that swept across the North Country. That's actually where I'm from. And when I visited after the ice storm, the damage was uh, incomprehensible. I have just never seen anything like that and I hope I never do again. But the climate change is going to lead to more ice storms because instead of having cold weather where you know, whatever temperature range you have usually comes down as snow, we're gonna be straddling that, that freeze boundary, which is going to lead to more ice storms. I think the effects are still being studied. It, it does cause a lot of down wood. Um, I can tell you from my observations in the North Country that the forests do recover. It takes a lot of time though. The mortality is incredible. And um, ice storms do tend to be fairly patchy. They require a very specific set of climatic variables for that much ice to accumulate. So there tends to be a, a narrow band that is strongly affected by that and other areas that are less affected. Um, I would refer you to, I, I hope it's on the Cary Institute website somewhere. I know that Lindsay Rustad gave a talk recently about her ice storm research. So I think that's on the video page of the Cary Institute because I remember seeing that. Yeah. So I would refer you to the research of Lindsay Rustad, and I believe there is a video of one of her talks on the Cary Institute website. It was a research project they did at the Hubbard Book Ecosystem where they actually created ice storm conditions. With a fire hose. With a fire hose in the winter. 
Here's a great question. How do you see it most effective to coordinate stewardship across landscapes given landowners have different perspectives, goals, and access to information and professionals? Boy, that's the question. How do we get people to collaborate together towards a common goal? And I think part of it is education and part of it is the ability to talk with your neighbors and try to work towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with managing forests. It's the same problem with managing white-tailed deer. Um, and if we can do that, we can be much better stewards of our land. Yes, and someone has typed into the Q&A some great resources. The Master Forest Owners Association of Cornell Cooperative Extension they have local folks who are forest owners and know a good amount of information. They will do site visits to your house. Um, if you look, um, if you just Google Master Forest Owners Association of Cornell, that should come up. And Cornell Forest Connect is a great resource for that. So thank you for posting that, much appreciated. Here's a question. When you discussed species within different successional stages, you didn't mention cedar and here I think they're probably talking about eastern red cedar uh, largely in white pine woodlands. Uh, should they be cut down to make room for the next species or left alone so as not to host, uh, left alone they may host invasive vines. I don't think there's a need to cut them down and in fact they probably are providing structure in your forests that are beneficial. Um, they're not they're not competing with the living trees. They're a remnant of those old pastures uh, and poor soils that were left after pastures were abandoned. And Eastern red cedar and little blue stem grasses are a very unique um, habitat type that was sort of uh, common in these abandoned old pastures. And we're just seeing now in many parts of the, the Hudson Valley that the last remnants of these little blue stem red cedar um, habitats are disappearing and becoming forests again. But they're a unique kind of uh, exciting um, habitat and they're worth, worth maintaining if you can do it. Mm -hmm. And if you do have invasive vines climbing up them, just chop the vine and that'll kill it. It'll probably come back. You have to stay on that, but just go out with a pair of loppers and chop through all those vines to kill them. And you, you, and you do have to do that more than once, but that is one way to keep it from turning into a curtain of vines. Our ag assessment encourages logging of the woodlots for a property tax reduction. Shouldn't they encourage leaving trees instead of cutting them? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm the best person to answer that. Um, but as I understand it, the logging, the forestry management plans are drawn up by a, a certified forester and they are long-term plans. So there is you know, a cutting regimen on you know, five, 10, 20 years, whatever. Um, and I think they can be highly variable. There's various intensities of logging that are done and I believe that the landowner can work with the forester to kind of customize the plan. You're right that leaving trees is generally better than cutting them from an ecological perspective. But on the other hand, sometimes removing certain trees can allow their competing neighbors to flourish even more. So it is a, an acceptable forest management technique. It has to be done carefully as, as you're saying, I think, to to maximize the positive benefits for the forest. The other thing to remember is that uh, removing trees through logging is not the same as removing trees to develop a piece of land as residential housing or commercial space. Um, the logging process really is a disturbance that creates an earlier successional stage in your forest, but it's not pulling that land out of a ecological um, condition where it can still be healthy. And so to think of moving back successional stages is, is not the same as thinking about removing a particular piece of land from 
actual um, production as, as field forest or some other habitat. Logging in general um, is not necessarily a bad thing. Right, it often looks pretty unpleasant when it's happening, but it, when it's done right, it's, it's good for the forest in the long run. And here's a somewhat of a follow-up question. Is it normal to see so many downed trees in the woods in this area? Is it a sign of an unhealthy um, or healthy forest? So it kind of depends on why the trees have fallen down. <laughs> Um, trees have a lifespan, just like every other life form that we have, and they do get old and die eventually. Um, many of the mortality incidents that we have are due to invasive pests. So what we're seeing right now is a lot of dead ash trees in Dutchess County as the emerald ash borer has moved through. And it's a, it's a very deadly beetle. Um, so there are a lot of dead ash trees. There are occasional, you know, tip ups from heavy winds where a tree will blow down. It's not a sign of an unhealthy forest to see a lot of trees on the ground. Um, it just means that there has been some kind of disturbance or possibly a pest that has um, damaged or killed the trees. Um, trees go through, you know, their own lifespan. And remember, a forest is composed of a lot of different trees with all different um, possible lifespans. So it's, it's not a sign of an unhealthy forest unless they've all been killed by a disease or a beetle. Oh, and just one note on that, the emerald ash borer, the, the research is showing that about one in a thousand ash trees are resistant to the emerald ash borer. So there's a very strong recommendation for people to not preemptively cut down your ash trees just because this insect is doing so much damage there's a possibility that some of these trees are going to survive and will provide a next generation so we don't lose the species entirely. And we want to remind people that if you do have dead ash to please not to move that wood <clears throat> very far because by doing so you can actually spread the beetle and increase the speed at which we lose ash from our forests. Right, and here's another question uh, very similar. Should we leave fallen trees alone? And the answer is generally yes, they will just break down and decay into the forest. Um, if it fell down across your driveway, do feel free to move it uh, or in your lawn or on your house. Um, so those can certainly be moved, but fallen trees in the forest are perfectly normal course of, of a, tree, a tree's life. So those can definitely be left alone. They'll be habitat for a lot of other creatures. The same goes for standing dead trees. If you have those in your forest, it's really important to leave them standing because they provide critical wildlife habitat. Of course, if they're leaning over your house or along the road or something where they pose a, a threat, you wanna take them down. But if they're not causing a threat, it's much better to leave them standing and let them fall on their own at some point and let wildlife use them until that happens. Mm -hmm. And here's another question. What can we do as trees like hemlock and ash are killed off by diseases? So I think that we have covered that pretty well. The hemlock will eat adelgid is the issue with the hemlocks. So in general, just leave them be. Um, don't move firewood from those species because you could be spreading those pests. I think we may have reached about the end. We are. We can probably just do maybe one or two more questions and before 730. Uh, someone see. asked what my last name is. It's Fargione, Michael Fargione. Sorry if I didn't make that clear at the beginning. Let's see. And so someone is wondering, where does hemlock fit into forest succession in this area? Hemlocks are a very shade tolerant species. And so they can establish at any point in the succession process, but they're most often dominant towards the mature forest where they outcompete other species for light. They're also um, very good at competing um, in areas of high moisture. Um, and so they're often found on northern or eastern slopes 
uh, along streams and places where uh, they can outcompete other plants because of moisture regimes. All right, so it is 730. We should definitely be wrapping up. I'm sorry if we did not get to your question. We'll be back next uh, next Tuesday at 6 p.m. for our next um, installment where we'll be looking at threats to our native forests here. And we hope you will join us again. We will be posting a video of tonight's talk on the Cary website. And so we'll be sending you a link to that video. Uh, we hope you'll join us again in the next uh, session. And until then, thank you all and good night. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.